Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Thank you for stopping by. This is all about wine education. You'll find the information you need to enjoy wine more. Most of my videos follow very, very important wine syllabus of wine qualifications. So if you are studying the world of wine, such as the WSET level three you here, see here on the slide, then you'll find the information you need to supplement your studies. So welcome to a series here looking at the systematic approach to tasting wine. So this is the technical way for the WSET certificate. And we are here looking at uh, series three about how to nose a wine. So what to do to maximize your ability to assess a wine on the nose. We are here on part one. Part one, we'll talk about what the condition is, what are wine faults and taints, and also how to talk about the intensity. If you do have any comments or questions, please do get in touch by commenting on this video below. This is a free video, as is part two, but parts three, four, and five are only available to those of you who subscribe to my e-learning portal. You'll find information about that over at winewithjimmy.com. So let's talk about the overview here on the nose. So you'll see these are the parameters that one must look at when talking about the nose. So we go through condition, intensity, the aromas through primary, secondary, and tertiary, and then the development. So in this video, we'll be talking about condition and intensity. So the uh, large part of pleasure to be gained from tasting wine comes from the aromas and the differences in character and complexity of the aromas account for much of the difference between basic quality and of course, very fine wines. You should swirl the liquid to release the aromas in the glass, then place your nose near the rim of the glass and take a short sniff and you'll note the condition first of all. Uh, this is what kind of state the wine is in, the development, the intensity, and of course the aromas. So that's everything you see up there on that slide. Some of the aromas are very delicate and you might gain some insight into a wine by taking a quick sniff before swirling. I always urge my students to actually not swirl to begin with and smell the wine, certainly to just check the condition, but also intensity, because when you swirl, it always brings a wine out the glass more. So I urge my students to not swirl first and then smell for intensity. And then when you want to pick up the primary, secondary and tertiary aroma characteristics, that's when we go crazy with the swirling action, of course. So let's talk about the condition first of all. Now, assessing faults in terms of practical for the WSET level three is not a skill that is assessed. You are not required to identify practically how to um, look at sort of you know, things like corked and oxidation and so on. But it is important that you are aware of the common wine faults and you are able to identify them, certainly theoretically. So let's go through those major faults. The first one is 246 trichlorinanosol, or otherwise known as TCA, or to you and me, mostly a corked wine, when someone says it's corked. So this taint gives the wine aromas reminiscent of damp cardboard, musty, fusty. It's those kind of characteristics. I've heard people say things like, uh, charity shop smell. I know that sounds quite not so nice, uh, but it's that kind of garagey sort of damp smell. Now at low levels, the taint can be very hard to identify, but fruit flavors in particular will be muted. They will be reduced and the wine appears less fresh. So that's what the arrow on the right hand side is depicting. Now, one of the main causes of this fault is tainted cork. There are others actually in terms of barrels as well, but it's really about the cork that we are looking at. And this is where the cork becomes infected 
with a bacteria and the wine that comes in contact with that cork then becomes flavored by that. Um, there is lots more information if you please look at my video on what is cork taint and about how to remedy it in terms of wine production and different cork closures. But for now, we're just talking about what it is and how to identify it in this presentation. Next up is reduction. So reduction is uh, a category that gives a wine quite a stinky character. Um, it can be both positive and negative. The negative side is when you get things like rotten eggs, boiled cabbage, boiled onions, blocked drains. Um, most of those are not too positive. Um, but we must understand that actually low levels of reduction can be quite positive. So this is when we might get something like flint or wet stone characteristic in a wine, uh, typically through interaction with gross lees, for example. So there can be positive aspects of it as well. Um, and in some instances, reduction can also blow off with some oxidation. So it may be something when you freshly open the bottle that's a little bit strong. Now, one of the things to talk about here, and I do go into much more detail about this in other videos. Remember, this is just identifying it. But you have sulfur in wine, you have water, and these can be combined to produce hydrogen sulfate, which is H2S that you see in your picture there. This typically happens when there are issues around the yeast in the fermentation. It potentially doesn't have enough nutrients. It goes a bit slow or gets stuck, and it can produce this H2S, which gives a stinky character. It will be remedied by adding yeast nutrients. Okay, so that is reduction. It's much more complex than this, but this is just for the level three certificate. Uh, sulfur is next. So sulfur dioxide, this is added to almost all wines, but levels tend to be higher in sweet wines. So sulfur is very, very much important in winemaking. It's naturally found in wine through fermentation. And then it is added at various very strategic times at winemaking to protect the wine. Not always, but very often. Now, if too much is added at very high levels, it can give a wine an acrid smell of kind of match, struck match or extinguished matches. At low levels, it can mask the fruitiest, fruitiness of the wine, uh, <clears throat> but it does need to be used because insufficient sulfur dioxide used at winemaking and just before bottling can cause premature oxidation in the wine. So it's something that we really have to get a balancing act with. Oxidation is next. This is the opposite of reduction. Uh, so reduction is where there is a lack of oxygen and it occurs uh, in those winemaking stages. But also you've got oxidation here, of course, which is the in interaction with oxygen. Now, it's typically caused by a failure of the closure, allowing unwanted oxygen to interact with the wine. Uh, but it can actually occur at multiple stages. It could occur at production. It could occur at transport and storage. And it can occur at service of wine. So it's very challenging. So at production level, it could be that too much oxygen has got to the wine. Maybe uh, the bung hole has been opened too frequently into the barrel, for example, or lids have been left off um, and there's too much oxygen affecting it. In the transport and in storage, it is uh, in terms of things like temperature, UV light, um, too much movement, and this can damage uh, the closure. And then in service, it is in places like restaurants, bars, hotels, pubs, uh, where the wine has been served by the glass and too much oxygen has affected. The, the um, keeping the wine fresh has not been too positively done by that establishment, so it can happen. Now, the wine will appear deeper colored and more brown than it should be, like the picture you see here. And it may have aromas of toffee, honey, caramel, or coffee. 
and will lack freshness and fruitiness. Now, some wines are purposely made like this, like fantastic wines from Jura in eastern France, Vin Jaune, but also things like Tawny Ports, uh, things like Sherries, for example. So these are not considered faults, but complexity. But in fresher wines, of course, this could be considered a fault. So please do remember there are positive oxidation, controlled oxidation like barrels and bottles, for example, but also negative oxidation. Sometimes wines can be out of condition. So these are wines that have lost their vibrancy and their freshness, and they may taste dull and stale. This is either because they are too old or they have been stored in poor conditions, somewhere too hot, somewhere too bright, somewhere too variable, like a kitchen when it gets far too hot during the cooking and then gets far too cold outside of that time. Now, wines out of condition in some places in the world, like the United States, they often refer to light affection when light has affected the wine as light struck. So a wine can become light struck. Typically, this happens when wine bottles are in shops, when they're sitting in the sunlight near the window of the shop, for example. Combined with out of condition, the wine may also be experiencing oxidation. The next is volatile acidity. All wines will have some volatile acid. It's called VA. And at low levels, this helps make the wine seem more fragrant and more complex. So some wines are actually very much positively affected by VA. Things like Nebbiolo in Piemonte have that kind of tar characteristic which comes through from the VA and it adds to complexity. Um, some orange wines have a lifted aroma due to volatile uh, acidity. However, very high levels of volatile acidity can give the wine aromas that are often described as things like vinegar, nail polish remover. Um, positively, though, sometimes you can find them being called balsamic or uh, things like pickles, for example. So it is possible to have some positive sides to it. Um, the last sort of taint or fault we'll talk about is Bretonomyces, or shortened to Brett. This is a yeast that can give wine very, very distinctive characteristics like plastic, um, sticking plasters, animal aromas, hot vinyl, smoked meat, leather, sweaty horses, rancid sort of stably, manure um, sort of countryside smell. Now, some consumers may enjoy some of these characters and they do not consider that low levels of Bretonomyces that has helped ferment that wine a fault, but some people will see it. And eventually as the wine ages, it really starts to dominate it. So it's a wild yeast that typically is found in certain places on certain grapes and in certain winery conditions. And it can affect the fermentation by giving very specific flavors. And now we talk about intensity before wrapping up this um, one. Remember the, the, we had the overview where we talked about condition and we've just gone through out of condition wines, but if the wine is fine, then we move on to the intensity next. And that's what you see here. Now, as a general rule, if when you insert your nose into the glass, the aromas are immediately apparent, even without sniffing, we would consider the wine being pronounced. So you don't even need to swirl it. You're picking up your glass and you can already smell it. Maybe it's a foot or away from you and you've got these intense characters. That's going to be a pronounced wine. If even after sniffing, you find the aromas to be faint or hard to detect, or I often say you have to really think about the wine, you've got your nose deep into the glass, then that will be a wine that has a light intensity. Otherwise, you might find it falling into the medium category, medium minus and medium plus. And that's what you see at the bottom of the slide. We select one of five in the scale, light, medium minus, medium, medium plus or pronounced. Now, by their very nature, red wines will often have more pronounced aromas because they have gone through skin maceration in the winery. So they maybe have sort of two weeks contact on the skins, which gives more character. So typically, 
red wines will be between medium and pronounced. White wines, though, can be anything from light to pronounced because they have not gone through that skin contact for the most part. But some varieties of white wines certainly are quite intense, like Gewürztraminer or Muscat or Torontes, for example. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that first part talking about condition and intensity, covering also wine faults. Please do join me for part two, where we will discuss the primary aromas of nosing wine. This is another free video, so see, I'll see you there on the other side. If you have any comments or questions, please do commenting on this video below. And if you find yourself in the UK, come and say hello and come for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now. Goodbye.